So chapter 23 was about measuring performance. So what does Hadley say that all coders have a hard time doing in relation to performance? This is how he opens the chapter. Yeah, so um, he says that, you know, everyone wants to think about efficiency on the front end as opposed to on after you've put in something down, actually looking at what's making your code slow, like where's that bottleneck? and that we're all really bad at it. So that's why he had to write a whole chapter about it. So what is profiling your code? computer froze in my back. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so Hadley talks about this at kind of the meta level as um, it's profiling is specifically going line by line with realistic inputs to identify what the um, bottlenecks are, as opposed to just going function by function. Um, because functions often call other functions. Man, T-Bone's got a wild lead out here. <laughs> Measuring performance focuses on micro benchmarks according to this chapter, true or false? This is true. So those micro benchmarks are the line by line um, benchmarking. Ooh, T-Bone has a streak on fire. True or false, R uses a fairly simple profiler called sampling or statistical profiler. So this is true. I can't remember what the other alternatives are, um, but just Hadley says the one that R uses is fairly simple and predominantly time-based. So do you get the same result each time you use a profiler? This is the function he uses in the book as the example. Right, so everyone got this, no. And this is because it's, you can have slightly different time, um, different things happening at different times in your code, depending on what your computer is doing. So theoretically, what does this pause using the same function what does this pause function return after 0 0.01 seconds? This is kind of hard. Yeah, so here, let's show the media. So after 0 0.01 seconds, um, if, you, if you are um, profiling this code, the only function that would have been called is the F function. So you pause for 0 0.01 seconds, and then after that pause is when you call G, and then after that is when you call H. So because you have this pause, only F would be returned. Ooh, Roberto's pumping up, but T-Bone still has a mega lead. What's going to happen? Six out of 20 questions. All right. The time plot, which you'll see in a second, shows that the H function is twice as slow as G. Okay, everybody got this. So yeah, it's not twice as slow. It 
has oops, more time, but that's because it's called twice. No movement in our scoreboard. So the flame graph on the bottom shows the order of the calls. So this is true. So um, we see that the function f calls, excuse me, calls g, and then g calls, calls h, which is why this kind of goes up a level. Um, and then the f function calls h as well. And then the pause is part of all of that, which is why it sort of stacks um, and adds the pause. Also, fun fact, this is called a flame graph. I've never heard that before. The last H in the flame graph corresponds to which function calling the H? And I cannot zoom in, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's look at this again. <laughs> yeah, I know, this was kind of tricky. So, um, H is called as part of G, and so, and all of this is called as part of, of F. So if you look at this plot, it's sort of this bar is all of F, and then this bar is all of G. And so this H that's stacked on top of this G function is the H that's called within the G function. And then this H function is only stacked on top of our F function, which indicates that it is this function. So R will also provide this data tab we'll see in a second, which is useful for large functions to zoom in on selected parts of those functions. Yes or no? Everybody got that. Um, and so this is basically the same information as the flame graph, just presented in a different way, which again, if you have a deeply nested call stack or if you have a very large function, um, this is just going to be more useful because it's more readable. So our garbage collector in R is a good indicator that our code is not efficient. Here's this example from the book. Yeah, so if we go here, um, our garbage collector is showing that we have a lot of memory being allocated, but then it's um, basically immediately freed because each time this for loop runs, you're redefining X. So that is what's taking up memory. But then when it's redefined, that is let go. But we also do need to be mindful of our garbage collector who shows that we need to recycle for more sustainability. All right, does profiling have limits? AKA, which of these doesn't fit? <laughs> Yeah, so this, to me, this wasn't necessarily as straightforward, um, partially because I haven't measured performance in this way before using R. So this chapter was my first exposure to profilers, but you know, R, for people who use RCPP or CCP, I can't remember, um, R can't actually look at those C functions. It, recognizes that it exists and then it just kind of passes over it. Um, it's also really not well suited if you have anonymous functions or with functional programming, you really need to define the functions. Otherwise, it's just going to look when you have a function within a function. Uh, you can refer to his description in the book in his example, but basically it, it's not intuitive when you're reading the output that um, how the like where the bottleneck is actually occurring. 
And then oh, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what lazy evals is. Maybe that was the function. Yeah, that was the function in a function. Um, go ahead. Oh, isn't that when you have like a function in an argument, but it doesn't execute the function until that argument is called later? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, and I just haven't, I haven't coded with it a lot, so it wasn't familiar to me. I was confused by the question wording. <laughs> yeah, my B, you guys. So after the Kahoot quizzes, it sends you a little email and it's like, these are the questions that you need to revise because you didn't write them very well. <laughs> and that's definitely going to be one of them. True or false, benchmarking can always make generalizations to real world implementations of code. Yeah, so this is false. I mean, you could definitely make the arguments that it's true. Hadley throws this flag of caution several times, which is that micro benchmarking is just that. It's a micro benchmark. So if you're trying to look at it on a macro level, um, you can't, it's not like one step to make those generalizations. You have to be really mindful about how you're generalizing. And if you're not mindful, you can come to some faulty conclusions. Uh, like that things matter when they maybe don't matter as much. So it's tricky. There's some movement in our scoreboard. 13 out of 20 questions done. What's going to happen in this last chunk? All right. Hadley likes the bench package for micro benchmarking because it can compare time differences on the tiny scale. So this is true. Um, the micro benchmarking, understanding the tiny scale is essential since it's that micro view of what's going on. Um, but when you're thinking about sort of practical scale up, this is something Hadley talks about too. Like how often are you calling a function? Does a couple nanoseconds of a difference matter for that scale up or not? Um, and that goes back to those generalizations that you make uh, for whether or not that they're mindful. <laughs> All right, so here's a micro benchmark that is testing two functions executing the same math. The answer is yes. I just wanted us to be able to take a second to look at this before we have questions about it because Kahoot doesn't give me that option. Good job, everyone. Okay, so we define this, this variable x and then we benchmark the square root of x and then this other way to do the square root of x. And benchmark returns this tibble that tells us the minimum uh, time, the median amount of time, um, how many iterations per second, how much memory is allocated, and the garbage collector. All right. Now we will have some questions. Is everyone is everyone ready for some questions about this? Okay. T-Bone has an answer streak on fire. <laughs> All right. So for this benchmark result, why is it multimodal? Yeah, so this was kind of tricky. Um, so the reason that this is multimodal is that your computer is doing different things at different points during the um, actual benchmark. So when your computer is allocating resources for other things such as running Spotify or the internet, um, it's just not gonna have as much accessible. So it'll be a little bit slower. Um, and so Hadley just points out a, pay attention to your units. So this is a log scale on our axis down here. And then also don't be surprised when you see these multimodal responses because this is just expected when you're looking at such a small scale of a difference. All right, how should we interpret these results? 
this was our custom built function and this is that square root function guys. Yeah, so if we look at um, these units, these are nanoseconds, which is a billionth of a second, question mark. Um, but Hadley talks about, you know, when you're trying to make these inferences on which to use, I mean, yeah, it's, it's easy enough to just change it to square root of x, but ultimately this difference is pretty insignificant. Um, depending on how many times you're calling the function. Some movement on our scoreboard. All right, which of these do you think will be the fact? Oh no. Oh, okay, there's supposed to be a picture here that is not here. But all of these functions are doing the same thing. What do you think will be the fastest? So we think that square root of x will be the fastest. And I'm going to switch over to r. I might have to reshare my screen. Can you see the r window or is it you still? OK, let me stop my share and reshare. And my cat is now on my lap. OK, um, Zoom froze, so I can't unshare and reshare my screen. But there is a graph that you can do. and. Um, Hadley has the code in his little book and you can compare all four of these. Basically, if you don't use the built-in square root function, they, the other three options all take about the same amount of time, but the square root function is a couple nanoseconds faster. All right. Do we know where that is? System.time. I can um, share. I had the code on my thing already. If you want to see it. Except I only have it in this like little. <laughs> um, can you see the pop out? Let me just share this. Here's all of them. This is square root of x. These two exponent ones are pretty much the same. And then this exponential log. I actually guessed that this one was going to be slower when I did the exercise. And I don't know why it was faster, but. Was it faster than the square root of x? No. No, that's Sorry, I this can't one. see what you're sharing. Zoom, Zoom is fighting me. <laughs> I think well, this is square root of x is only one function, like optimized for that mm -hmm. specific purpose, rather than. So I think I'm going to try leaving the meeting and coming back in if that's, if everyone's okay with that. I thought the exponent log will take longer because you have to do two function calls. Well, then I guess uh, it makes sense the square root being faster because then somewhere inside it's like hard coded that it's some the power of 0.5 mm -hmm. and then whilst they had uh operator probably accounts for all the like a generalized case mm -hmm. of when you have lower or powers yeah interesting um, yeah maybe it's like an r parser thing because of the hat it's like a maybe treated as like a special symbol it takes mm -hmm. longer yeah, have to like convert that into a function or something, maybe. Oh, you mean this? Yeah, why the 
the hat like a little like square bit versions, over. yeah, are a bit longer than the exponent log versions. Hey guys, I had to join back from my phone. Um, Zoom and Slack crashed, so I could no longer access the Zoom link. Um, I think there's one question left on our Kahoot. If you guys want to, I'll I'll just point my phone camera at my computer screen for the Kahoot. Okay, it'll be very fun, very interesting. Okay, also. I think, I don't know if you guys saw this question, but the system time in R is something Hadley talks about as an alternative to benchmark. And it's basically equivalent to what you would get running time function um, in bash. So system.time is less user-friendly than benchmark, true or false. That is very true, yep. So now you can see our podium. Good job, Jude. Good job, August. And then just knocking it out of the park <laughs> is T-Bone. Look at that confetti. <laughs> Thank you for uh, indulging in the cahoot. <laughs> Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's great. Bother me a little bit that that bench package will have like different units. Like they had nanoseconds and microseconds mixed, and I'm like, I don't know how to compare these numbers. That seems like a an odd choice. <laughs> Well, I guess you just got to plot it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's not good, is it? Have any of you guys ever used this for um, benchmarking any of your modeling? I haven't. Like, Maybe a long time ago, I tried it, but I don't really remember. <laughs> hmm. I was asked the other day um, <clears throat> about um, a system that I'm working on at the moment and trying to benchmark it and just thinking, you know, can you kind of like combine it, combine, create a tibble, sorry, of, um, of the bench of the performance and then compare that with several other ones in like a cross validation kind of way. Oh, but basically you know when you do if you do a model system and you like were to do um a time series kind of forecast with say uh recurrent neural net or with a uh, ream or something like that you know you want to to some extent when you're making a business case connect the time part with the with the actual forecasting accuracy because mm -hmm. then you can offset the accuracy increase or decrease compared to the uh, time it takes because when you start scaling up mm -hmm. it starts throwing in huge amounts of time so you want to know how much <coughs> for instance if you change to tensorflow or something or to h2o how long that's going to take in comparison yeah i've seen people in machine learning uh in papers like report the compute time but I always feel it's misleading on some that have a lot of tuning and like mm -hmm. there's sometimes a lot of time you spend like for a neural network for example just like picking the architecture and even if it runs really fast mm. <laughs> yeah it's a, I suppose one of the other things is um, benchmarking search grids 
Mm. So, because that's a that's a really big problem. So you need to. So if you're doing, you know, many models, mm. you know, how are you going to benchmark lots of different search grids? Because there's kind of that racing strategy, isn't there? To um, you, well, no, there's different ways to do search grids, and then there's racing strategies with different kind of modeling versions as well. So then you have to come. You have to do benchmarking. I was just thinking of a workflow, kind of how you would do benchmarking for the modeling version technique, mm -hmm. and then also for the grid search, or like you know how you know how do you go about doing that? Anyway, no mind. Yeah, it seems like you'd have to like really break it down. Uh, how, what does he say? He talks about like he makes the analogy of understanding like the physics of the atoms when you're baking doesn't actually help you like how to make it uh, help you understand how to make a cake so I imagine mm -hmm. if you're trying to compare across different kinds of models it, you'd want to do like a macro benchmarking if that's a thing as a after maybe doing some micro benchmarking mm -hmm. but yeah zero experience so making up what I'm saying <laughs> no the logic's good um you know that's typically speaking what you what what I was thinking about in general is just um it is actually genuinely a, quite a big problem when you go to industrial level, or well, I, I presume it goes the same for a lot of other systems as well. Mm -hmm. But when you start going into high levels in terms of the number of models you're building, the time really becomes a massive factor. Of course, mm -hmm. you know if you're doing something like genetic modeling, mm -hmm. then you know the same thing starts to apply because you could be taking up, say, the university's um, computing systems for like days. And that's when you know you start getting into conflicts between departments which nobody wants right yeah i will say i have done some not formal micro benchmarking but to use the cluster computer like you have to wait in the there's limits on how long like you can run something so you have to like know or else your job will get killed <laughs> that sounds a bit unfair <laughs> It's, it's a scoring system, actually. I call it because I used to work uh, back in my previous university as like in the department giving support to users. So, so how do you run your job on the cluster? And I used to tell them, like, imagine it's like a massive Tetris and your job or the resource that you are requesting is times, 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 times the, uh, the computational resources like CPUs. So CPUs times the limit time of your request. Because then some people uh, will abuse of it. Because then we'll say, well, I want to run for two weeks. Because I think that was the maximum we could. We allow them to. Mm -hmm. And so they will say two weeks and then 100 CPUs. Because then we have a massive cluster. So they could request insane amount of resources. Yeah. And they will waste them. Because then the thing is, once you allocate those resources, they're they are locked. Like no one can use, it, use them. So... And so people will sit there like running because then they had this R code and they will think it will run in parallel because it's like H2. I think it does some parallelization for you. You don't have to manually do it, mm. but then they will do it and not properly. And so they will be using one CPU when they request like 100. Mm. And so that's why we, there's limits. For, yeah. Yeah. And we tell them, like, you should do, like, a benchmark of your stuff, like, locally, and then estimate what's, how long will it take to run the entire simulation? Because uh, for me, that's the useful part of doing uh, benchmarking, like, micro-benchmarking. You get a sort of idea, mm -hmm. how long will it take with subset? Cause, and then from that subset, you say, okay, my final subset is 20 times bigger. And yeah. you can't say it'll scale linearly, but... Yeah. It's a rough estimate. So I feel like the memory was always harder for me to figure out than the time. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's good to see that R has this built-in function that kind of tracks both. Mm -hmm. Like the um I've done a lot of benchmarking with the um bash. So like the system dot time in R, which is the time in Bash, mm -hmm. and it doesn't inherently give you units. So you have to make sure what the units you're assuming are the accurate units 
uh, what it's measuring. Um, and then you have to explicitly ask it for the memory calculation. Otherwise, it just gives you uh, time. Mm. I've used Hadley's prior package, I think, to like figure out how much memory is in my, like how, how big an R object is and stuff like that. Is it prior? Yeah, object size, yeah. But I guess we learned some other stuff about that already in the beginning of the book. The next chapter is going to be quite interesting then um, because that's all about actually improving efficiency, isn't it? 